Hi! <laughs> welcome! <laughs> Hopefully you all can hear me. Uh, welcome to Archival Adventures, uh, live on twitch.tv slash vtulstudios and twitch.tv slash rogan27. I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, um, also known as Rogan27, as, you know, that is the channel. Um, <laughs> Let's see, who's here today? I see VTUL Kayla, welcome. VTUL Alice. I see uh, Avio Alice and Hannah and Organ Mike. And it looks like 16-Bit Eric just brought 42 Whimsies over to the Rogan27 channel. So welcome in, uh, Whimsies. Thank you, Eric, for the raid. Um, Adventures of Tony, Allura. Um, welcome, everybody, Atma Prime. Um, Wraith Faith, thank you for the 100 bits. Um, Lord Portico, Lady Amberwolf. I will uh, mention for anybody who is on the Rogan27 channel, um, we are on that channel raising money this month for an archival cause. Uh, so if somebody wants to do uh, command charity, um, you'll get some information. We are raising money for the... Um, the One Archives Foundation, which supports the One National Gay and Lesbian Archives at the University of Southern California. Um, they are the largest and oldest LGBTQ plus archives in the world. Uh, and so that money goes to help uh, preserve and share LGBTQ plus history. So if anybody wants to uh, donate, the link is there in the chat. Um, hello, hi, Philip. Uh, and Adventures of Tony, thank you for sharing that link. Um, for anybody who's new here and has not been to the show before, um, this show is one that I do on Wednesday afternoons from the archives here at Virginia Tech. Um, and basically, I pick a collection from, or some rare books from our collections and just share them with you. Um, oftentimes, as with today, I have never seen what's in the collection. <laughs> Uh, we have lots of materials, and uh, during the course of my regular work, I only see things occasionally. So um, this month, I've been focusing on any collections that say that they are related to ornithology and oology. Uh, that would be the study of birds or the study of egg-laying creatures, or more specifically, eggs. Um, so that is the plan today. We have a collection today, the John Murray Papers. Uh, but before we dive into that, I do want to do um, just an acknowledgement that um, I typically do at the beginning of the show. So I want to acknowledge the Tudelo and Monacan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live here at Virginia Tech and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. Um, I want to pay respect to the Tudelo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. I also want to acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation, and at any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. I want to pay respect to those souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to that legacy. Further, I want to acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and men, women, and children on this land, and acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university. So, today's collection, what we're going to be looking at is the uh, John Murray papers, and I have some information about them for for you so that you can get a little sense of what we're going to be looking at. Um, the John Murray Papers uh, document the participation of John Murray, a Virginia Tech chemistry professor from 1942 to 1971, uh, in or Virginia's ornithological community. So he was a chemistry professor here from 1942 to 1971, but these papers are not about his work as a chemistry professor. They are about his participation in Virginia's ornithological community, which would be the Virginia Tech community uh, that studies, or not 
sorry, the Virginia community, the entire um, Commonwealth-wide community that studies birds. Um, collected materials include manuscript articles, scholarly correspondence, and bird watching logs, uh, which focus largely on Montgomery County, Virginia. So the question then is, who is this John Murray? Uh, aside from just being a chemistry professor here, what makes him unique? What makes him special? Um, so John Walcott Murray was born in 1909 to Harris King Murray and Arabella Prime Murray of Flushing, New York. After graduating Phi Beta Kappa from Colgate University in 1930, Murray received his PhD in chemistry from John Hopkins University in 1933, and in 1939, Murray wed Ruth Terbor, um, the union produced two children, John Harris Murray and Beulah May M. Fincham. Uh, Murray taught chemistry at Virginia Tech from 1942 to 1971 and was promoted to full professor in 1954. In addition to his knowledge of chemistry, Murray was an ardent lover of birds. Murray published many articles and a yearly inventory, a checklist of the birds of Montgomery County, Virginia in the Journal of the Virginia Society of Ornithology, The Raven, while also participating in local Christmas bird counts. In 1994, Murray furthered his ornithological studies by logging 55 new species of birds during a trip to the Amazon rainforest. Following the loss of his first wife after 51 years of marriage, Murray married Nancy Slocum, whom he met at the age of 85. While living at Warm Hearth Community, Murray continued to study nature and was named Volunteer of the Year in 1994 for his services in the creation and maintenance of a trail system at the community. John Murray died on August 19, 2002. <clears throat> so what we have and what we're going to look at are his papers. And if we get through them, um, they are just one box of papers, one of our smaller boxes. If we do get through them, I still have the selected uh, works from our rare books collection that we can always pull out um, and take a look at. So um, if anybody, if one of the mods wants to drop the finding aid link in chat, um, the finding aid kind of describes what's in the collections and you're welcome to look through it and uh, let me know if there's a folder you specifically want me to pull out and take a look at. Otherwise, um, I'm just going to pull things out that sound like they might be interesting and we'll take a look at them together. Uh, because as I said, I have not seen what's in this collection apart from digging through for something that would work as an image for the uh, promotional tweet. So let me switch over to document focus so that you all can see the document that I currently have out here on the table. Um, so this is an item from folder number two, which is labeled Hawk Watching Logs and Instructions 1976 to 1988. Uh, it was the first item in the folder. And so what we have here is an item from the Hawk Migration Association of North America. I'll zoom in a bit so that you can see it better. Oh, I held down the button. OK, usually I end up zooming in way too fast there. Um, instructions for daily report forms. Standard daily lookout report forms are supplied by the Hawk Migration Association of North America to all hawk watchers who ask for them. The style of the report form has changed rapidly since 1974. Uh, we began with a design appropriate for casual record keeping, uh, and the forms were to be stored for researchers who would get their data by going through the sheets one by one. From the beginning, however, HMANA hoped to link up with, the, with computer technology to quickly advance knowledge of bird, prey mi bird of prey migration, and soon the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service became interested in key punching our data for computer-assisted studies. Basic changes were suggested to make the form computer compatible and to ensure that essential data conform to standards adopted by the World Scientific Community Metric Distances and Celsius Temperatures. Uh, 
So this is kind of interesting. I, I mean, depending on what you're researching, it's interesting. Uh, if you're particularly interesting how people studied birds of prey and their migration patterns, this gives some information about a transition in how that data was recorded over time. Uh, but also, if you're interested in the computerization of American work and the computerization of um, activities in America, this is talking about that. This is talking about taking existing forms that were used to track this data and uh, changing what's being recorded so that it will be compatible with computer databases. Um, it's talking about uh, key punching data, so taking forms that had been filled out by hand and then keying that into the computers uh, for computer analysis of data. Um, so this is, uh, looks like probably sometime toward the beginning of the time frame for this folder, so probably like 1976. Um, and then there's very specific instructions. All written numbers should be right justified. A single digit number goes in the rightmost column. A double digit number in the rightmost two columns, etc. Um, disregard numbers in small print on the form. They are guides for the key punchers only. Uh, and it gives a table of metric conversions, which for Americans is definitely necessary. Um, we, in America, we basically grow up with uh, things like Fahrenheit and yards and miles, and men, we're not really trained in how to convert those or how to think in kilometers or in Celsius units. So having a quick reference guide here is quite useful. Um, I know I was looking at uh, con temperature conversions earlier this week because we hit um, around 90 degrees about two days ago, which uh, in Celsius would be 32. Um, and then yesterday we were down closer to 70 degrees, which in Celsius would be 21. Uh, Alice, thank you for dropping the finding aid link in on Rogan 27. If you wouldn't mind, oh, there you go. You put it in over on uh, VTUL Studios as well. Thank you. Um, so the kinds of things it looks like they were recording in here, we have location, useful when you're tracking migration patterns, banding station, um, so that would be banding is when they catch the bird and they put a little metal band around its leg, um, and that uh, modern day would include a radio transmitter, but back then would have just been a metal band and they would have to catch the bird again to actually track an individual bird's migration, but that was the purpose of banding them. Um, it, so that they uh, can actually track where this bird is going um, as they catch it in multiple different locations and they're able to um, kind of connect those dots together. Um, station leader, maximum visibility. So that's talking about atmospheric visibility, air temperature, sky code. Using the table on the next page, enter the number best describing the predominant condition. Um, so the table on the next page, uh, clear, partly cloudy, mostly cloudy, overcast, wind-driven, sand, dust, snow, fog or haze, drizzle, rain, snow, thunderstorm, with or without precipitation. Wind speed code, wind from, indicating direction, altitude of flight code, flight direction, and number of observers. So, kind of interesting. Let's see. Also in this folder, we have some, this looks like mimeographs. Uh, so mimeographed instructions. If you're unfamiliar with the mimeograph process, it is an alcoholic uh, or alcohol-based um, method of copying 
a document, uh, and it produced the this kind of purple uh, colored text on a page, um, and had a kind of like fruity alcoholic smell to it. It's a very distinctive smell. If you'd ever been around a mimeograph machine, you would definitely remember the smell if you're able to smell things. Um, so here we have Hawk Watch report form instructions. The Clearinghouse Committee of the Hawk Migration Association of North America has developed the enclosed standard daily report form for the, for the use of all participating lookouts. Uh, date, year, precise location, and name of the count taking leader Use standard time, not daylight savings time. Uh, for each hour, record weather conditions and numbers of hawks observed. Interesting that they want standard time and not daylight savings time, whereas today, I think they would more likely default to daylight savings time because um, we've cut back now to where the only time it's standard time is between, like, November and March, and the rest of the year is all daylight savings time. So that would actually be more standard. The mitiographic process, <laughs> Lord Portico, that is, uh, I, I'm going to call that a speak attack. Yeah. Um, <laughs> mitiographic. Um, so it gives instructions on what you're supposed to fill in. Um, tips. Be conservative. Do not be afraid to mark down a bird as unidentified if you are not sure. Be sure to note that unidentified hawks should be differentiated by type when possible. Remember that children, fourth grade and up, have keen eyes and make great spotters. For rarities, please record the exact time observed and sex and or age if possible. Preferably rarities not observed and identified by at least two competent observers should be recorded as unidentified. Remember that your data will eventually go into a data bank on hawk migrations and accuracy is really necessary. Also completeness. The Hawk Migration Association, now two years old, is seeking grants or other funding from scientific foundations and must convince a potential, potential grantor that data gathered by amateur birders is quite trustworthy and reliable. Filling in forms is tedious and sometimes seems repetitious and needless, but is important. Let's all help fight records pollution. And how? <laughs> Let us fight records pollution. Um, I love that the end of it is good hawking. <laughs> Below fourth grade, we can't trust them. Yeah, absolutely not. Here we have, uh, this is another mimeographed item from September 10th, 1976. Hawk watchers alert. Bird watching with a purpose. That is the watchword that the Hawk Migration Association of North America will adopt for the 1976 fall migration season. Keep the watch this year from your chosen lookouts for as many hours as possible and send in your records. Our special coordinated Hawk Watch in Virginia will be held September 25th when it is hoped that every club will have teams at their lookouts for at least the six hours from 9.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. For the report forms, your record keeper will translate to standard time. In case of bad weather on the 25th, the watch will be held September 26th or October 2nd or 3rd as necessary. Most of you enjoyed our coordinated Virginia watch last year and our total effort fed considerable migration data into the stockpile of records of the Clearinghouse Committee of the Hawk, Watch Hawk Migration Association of North America. We are urged to hold these watches annually and keep the records coming. Those who have time to watch on other days during the season are encouraged to do so. 
little is known of what happens to those concentrations of broad-winged hawks that funnel down from Canada through New England each autumn, after they leave Hawk Mountain and other Pennsylvania lookouts following a southwesterly course. What are their routes and dispersal patterns until they again appear in large aggregations along the Texas border near Mission, heading for Central America? Accumulating large amounts of hawk migration data effect eventually will answer numerous important questions about these fascinating birds of prey. Your efforts will make a very real contribution and you will have fun while birding with a purpose. HMANA hopes that you will have the thrill of seeing lots of hawks gliding through the crisp autumn air and enjoy this grandeur and glory. But in case hawk flights are disappointing at your lookout, remember that negative data is good data. The report sheet including full weather information should be kept as usual and sent in. Record keeping is rather boresome and repetitious, and we'd all rather be looking at hawks. But one of the big problems at, in HMNA's, HMANA's efforts to obtain funding adequate to start a system of processing records in a computer bank is the difficulty of convincing potential grantors that information gathered by amateurs is solid and dependable. They hope these doubts will be cleared up by the top quality of this year's record input. If you have questions, I have some answers ready. I attended the HMANA conference at Duluth, Minnesota, September 2nd through 5th and enjoyed becoming steeped in hawk-watching lore. Sincerely, Miriam P. Moore. We're sending you the hawks every year and you weren't tracking them? <laughs> Yeah, uh, they definitely are sent, and like, it, it's, the hawks are coming, you just have to pay attention. That was kind of the message in there, wasn't it? So this is one of the hawk watching sheets. Uh, this is the actual, like, tally sheets. Um, let's zoom out just a skosh more. And so this would be one that was actually recorded by uh, John Murray. Um, this appears, let's see, it was recorded on the 15th of September, 1979, I think. There's a, a lot of ink in that first box, but I do think it is the 15th of September. Um, lo uh, recorded at Potts Mountain. I'm not sure where that is personally. Um, and let's see, it appears that between eight and nine in the morning, uh, three turkey vultures were observed. Between 10 and 11, five turkey vultures were observed. Between 11 and 12, one turkey vulture. 12 to one, three turkey vultures for a total of 12 turkey vultures. Um, it looks like six sharp shinned. I am not familiar with that kind of hawk. Uh, one Cooper's hawk. Two unidentified buteos. 285 broad wing talks. That is a lot of hawks. Two osprey, four unidentified falcons, three American kestrels, for a total of 315 hawks that were observed. It appears he observed between, uh, between eight in the morning and four in the e afternoon and saw 315 hawks on Potts Mountain. But then on the 21st, only 93 hawks. Still mostly broad-winged hawks. And then we have also uh, one here from September 12th. 
that doesn't give me a total tally, but there were 347 Broadwing talks on the 12th of September. Oh, sorry, 12th of September, 1981. So, oh, and this is September 21st, 1980. Interesting. So 1979, 315 hawks. 1980, the day he observed, there were only 93. And then 1981, there were just shy of 400 hawks based on the, the numbers that are actually there. And you have to actually know enough about the different kinds of hawks to be able to kind of observe and note down the tallies correctly there. Oh, thank you, Kayla. It looks like Potts Mountain is in Craig County, Virginia. Let's see what else we have. I don't know that we'll spend much time on this folder, but I'll pull it out anyway, and we will take a look. Uh, this folder is Article Drafts, 1944 to 1974. We have an article titled, A Black Vulture's Nest in Montgomery County, Virginia. So th this would be somebody, John, Murray would be somebody who was familiar with how to structure and write an academic paper. Um, and while his expertise was not in ornithology, uh, it wouldn't be a stretch for him to be able to publish on ornithology given his background in um, kind of academic chemistry. So we've got that notes on some nesting warblers of Montgomery County. I'm not going to read the articles. I just want to kind of look at the titles and see. Oh, here we have a letter about an article. Dear Dr. Murray, I enclose for possible use in the Raven on account of my observations in the stilt sandpiper of the stilt sandpiper last fall. Uh, if you think it is too detailed, please whittle it down. I also enclose for your examination three photographs which are mentioned in the text to permit you to check my identification. Will you kindly return them when you have finished with them as they are the originals and I have no duplicates? I seem to remember reading that you wanted data on the red-headed woodpecker. The following were observed on the Virginia Polytechnic Institute farm April 28th, 3, August 29th, 4, and December 29th, 1. Sincerely yours, John W. Murray. And so that was addressed to Dr. J.J. J. Murray in Lexington, Virginia. Uh, and then there's the article, uh, Stilt, si Stilt Sandpiper in Blacksburg, Virginia. We have an article, oh dear. One of my computers went to sleep. Hopefully the, the stream stays up while I get it back up. There. <laughs> Kayla, uh, have fun at your meeting. Fun. Um, but yeah, you should definitely exit all social, social situations with happy hawking from now on. Um, a Brewster's Warbler near Blacksburg, Virginia. So these are short, like single page articles. Observations on some summer residents in the Poverty Creek. Uh, note on red crossbills near Blacksburg, Virginia. Um, so Various articles, all of those seem to have been submitted to The Raven. Um, and no, this is not a writing desk. I know you may think it looks like a writing desk, 
uh, because ravens are quite like writing desks, desks but um, this is, in fact, a journal. Uh, the Journal of the Virginia Society of Ornithology. Uh, this is volume 45, number 3, from September 1974. And in it, it includes a checklist of the birds of Montgomery County, Virginia, banding results of the Kiptopkeek uh, Kip Bee. Ooh, that's, that is a tongue tripper. Banding results at Kip Topki, Kip Topi, Kip Topiki Beach in 1973. Kip Topiki. A white ibis in the Appalachian region of Virginia. Lesser black backed gull at Chincoteague Refuge. Raven nesting in Piedmont, Virginia, as well as an in memoriam for William Houston, news and notes, and annual meetings of the Virginia Society of Ornithology. The interesting one to this collection being the first one, the checklist, which was by John Murray. So I will flip to that page and we'll take a look and see what it looks like. Oh, interesting. Uh, And indeed, I should have just realized, since it is the first thing in the table of contents, it is the first thing in this issue, uh, page 55 being the first page in the issue. <laughs> um, so there's an introduction to the checklist, and then literally a checklist. I think we looked at one of these before because I think we saw an issue of the Raven earlier in the month. Um, so there's a list of the people who did observations and that led to the comp co compiled list here. Um, so let's see. If I look at one of these entries, the Horned Grebe... Uh, Podiceps auritus, uncommon winter visitor, observed 24 October by C. O. Handley. Uh, to and then it appears to have also been observed at least through 9 April by John Murray. So it's just literally just a listing of birds that have been observed in Montgomery County, Virginia, um, giving dates and who the actual observer was, which is interesting. This is, um, as noted on the front, corrected copy. So I don't know if this was the final printing and he just went through and hand wrote corrections himself or if this was a proof that he corrected um, interesting let's see what else we have so folder number three Montgomery County bird records and sightings 1960 to 1973 So this appears to be essentially the same kind of thing that we were just looking at, but these are the prepared manuscripts that would have been submitted to the journal, I suppose. So this is 1960. Um, and you get the same kind of list but clearly prepared on a typewriter. Then we have 1961. Oh, wow. Actually, let me, let me dig into this 1961 for a second here. So we have the typed pages at the front. Um, 
where we find out that, oh, you know, the common loon has been observed, hull bulls, red-necked grebe, horned grebe, pie-billed grebe, black-capped petrel, double-crested cormorant, great blue heron, American egret, etc. Um, and there's some handwritten dates next to the items. Uh, but if I go far enough in, we have this handwritten tally. that appears to literally just be names of birds with dates they were observed. So here we've got the cedar waxwing, um, February 27th, April 22nd, September 14th, October 2nd, and December 27th. Um, and so it seems like maybe that was how the data was compiled for the other winter birds, 1960 to 61. Winter birds, 1959 to 1960. It's literally just a bird name and a series of dates indicating that those birds were observed on those dates. Summer birds, 1960. It's so meticulous. Like, I would, um, I tend to be somewhat analytical about certain things, but I'm not sure I could ever do something like this. I enjoy birds, but it's so precise uh, and data-driven, and while I enjoy organizing information and I enjoy a good database, I would be too distracted just paying attention to the birds. I feel like paying attention to the data about the birds would kind of detract from the experience of watching the birds. <laughs> but I guess that's the difference between a bird watcher and an ornithologist. Because uh, if you're bird watching, yeah, you just want to go out and see the birds. Uh, you might want to take pictures. You might want to take um, data about what you saw, et cetera. Uh, but you're there to see the birds primarily. For an ornithologist, you're there to collect data on the birds. And yes, key squared, the birds have metadata. <laughs> um, so here, again, a bunch of sightings, these from the 70s and early 80s, it looks like. I'm not going to dive into them unless somebody particularly wants to know about a specific bird in a specific year. Uh, Christmas bird count, background, planning, and statistical information, 1958 to 1999. Um, yeah. Yeah, key squared. I'm doing ornithology every Wednesday in June. So we have this week and then next week for more ornithology stuff. Um, and then two weeks from today, um, on July 7th, uh, I think it's July 7th, the, f the first Wednesday in July, we will start looking at um, American backyard grilling. Uh, the tradition of the backyard barbecue, tailgating, etc. So that's what the focus will be in July. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm trying to do a theme each month. And I'm thinking, I think August, I may try to look at the early history of computers. Um, but I'm not set on that yet. Um, Christmas bird count instructions. Count must take place entirely during one day. The date to be selected by the local count group within the period specified by the National Audubon Society. Generally, it is to be from dawn to dark. The count must be within and preferably fill a circle 15 miles in diameter. 
the results of Christmas counts are used as the raw data for scientific studies in ornithology. Hence, it should be emphasized that no bird should be recorded unless it has been positively identified. Although it may give some satisfaction to amass a large list of species, the count should not be regarded as a competition, but rather an attempt to assess the actual abundance of the various species at this time. If the section leader has any doubt of the correctness of a reported observation, he may decide to omit it from the record. There are 12 sections in the Blacksburg count area. Many observations may be made near the boundary between two or three sections. If any uncommon observation is made near a boundary, this fact, including time and place, should be reported so the compiler may eliminate probable double sightings of the same bird. The final report for the count contains information on time of start and finish, weather, uh, max and min temperature, sky conditions, precipitation, depth of snow, wind direction and velocity, ice on waters, wild food crop, party hours, party hours, I love that it's capitalized, um, on foot, in car and others, such as by boat or airplane, uh, if the party divides during the part of the day, the time it is separated is multiplied by the number of sub-parties, data from the party, wow, this is very complex. <laughs> was not worth it. Barbecue talk is making you hungry. End of month transition with big chicken barbecue. Yeah, I'm not a huge barbecue person myself. I don't mind backyard grill. It's the barbecue sauce that I'm not a huge fan of. Um, but yeah, I've been doing a look just to prepare for it. And I've been trying to figure out what cookbooks we have that would give me a little bit of history. Um, as well as any collections that we might have that would be relevant. Um, and then just kind of researching the history of American backyard grilling myself, um, which has been rather fascinating and I'm interested to share it. Yeah, the, these RPG rules are quite interesting. Uh, <laughs> Lord Portico. What I find fascinating is reading through this, um, I don't know if anybody watching plays or has played any of the Pokemon games, uh, particularly Pokemon Snap, um, which a new version of just came out. And since we're on Twitch, I feel like talking about video games while looking at uh, ornithology records makes perfect sense. But um, Pokemon Snap, basically you go into a region and you take pictures of the Pokemon that are there. So it's like going into a region and recording, like the, the rules here about how to go about documenting the birds in a given area feels very similar to like the activity of going into an area, trying not to disturb the wildlife, but just to document what's there, which is sort of what that game is doing. And if anybody is aware of the history of the Pokemon franchise, that video game franchise was intended to replicate scientific taxonomic work in examining uh, insects um, and the study of insects and uh, kind of the, especially insects that go through a multi-phase transition. So uh, think a butterfly, Chris, or like caterpillar, chrysalis butterfly, um, that sort of scientific endeavor was the inspiration for that game. And so it isn't surprising to me that reading through something like this about observing wildlife uh, makes me think of that video game series. <laughs> Yes, Keysword, we have found a document that makes early GURPS supplements look straightforward and light on detail. Um, and these are meant for volunteer observers. So these instructions are not, they're meant for lay people. They're not meant for um, serious scientists. They're meant for whoever comes to volunteer. Um, but they're very meticulous because they wanted to get usable data out of them. Here's a Dear John letter. 
um, only not ending a relationship. It's just addressed Dear John because the person's name is John. Uh, I had a letter last week from Handley Sr. who told me he had accidentally run into you on a, receipt, on a recent trip and that he and you agreed that December 23rd would be the most convenient date for the Christmas bird count, as far as you are, all are concerned. I've already written him agreeing that it makes sense for you all to go ahead and plan the census without me. I'm enclosing herewith the full instructions and compilation form sent to me as last year's compiler by the Audubon Society. You and the others can fight it out for the chore of completion. As you doubtless know, the Society insists on exact compliance with all the rules. They would undoubtedly be delighted to have a chance to throw out ours, or any other, for failing to follow their regulations to the letter. It seems like there might be a little bit of um, annoyance at the Audubon Society uh, indicated there. You and the others know pretty well that the territories are uh, what the territories are, which we have now pretty well standardized. Perhaps you might refresh yourself by referring to the letters I sent out after the 1956 and 1957 censuses under dates of January 15, 1957 and January 2, 1958. On second thought, you may not have saved them. Yeah, it is a Dear John letter. Um, oh, geez, people. I am very, very sorry. I literally just realized I never started the captioner and um, it is entirely my fault. I apologize profusely. Uh, it should be on now and hopefully captions will show up very shortly. Uh, I'm going to refresh my page to see if they appear. But I feel saddened. Wait, it's not working. Uh-oh. Hmm, let me look. Are they working over here? I don't know. Okay, they're working there. Something's not working here. Um, settings? That's fine. Just Please? <laughs> oh boy. Have fun. Uh, you, you can read the letter for a moment while I try to figure out why I'm not getting any input on this microphone leading me to not have any captions. Um, sound settings. Input. Is that going to do any better? Maybe? I think I may have gotten it. Yes! <laughs> captions! We have captions! Do you still have music? That is the, the next question. You do. Awesome. We've been trying to get it to work so that I could be playing sound for you because at some point I will probably want to do some digital video collections again. Um, so I'm trying to make sure that we have it so that I can play something for you. You can hear it, but I can also hear it so that I know when to stop if I'm playing a section of an interview or something like that. Um, and today we got the sound working again, but then I forgot to turn on the captions and didn't realize that uh, the microphone was not active and picking up my words to be able to caption it. But it seems like we're all good now. So thank you for bearing with me there. Um, 
there are a lot of moving parts to make this work, and it is literally two of us doing that at this point. Uh, Alice, my mod, who got things set up ahead of time physically, and then I come in and get logged into all the stuff and uh, get things going. Um, <laughs> so let's see here. Uh, we've got that letter. the literal Dear John letter. Um, then we have, it looks like a map. Interesting, this is the Christmas Bird Count Circle, 1973 and before. And so this is a map of uh, Southwest Virginia. Here's Brush Mountain. Um, this is the Jefferson National Forest along here. Um, Blacksburg is in this area, and Christiansburg is down here, it appears. Um, this is Strobel's Creek, which uh, runs through Virginia Tech. This is the, um, over here, where it says, Property of Radford Ordnance Works on the map. That is the Radford Arsenal, um, which manufactured uh, weapons during World War II, and um, it's, it maintains a supply of, of weapons. Uh, and so that is not too far from Virginia Tech's campus. Uh, but so the bird watching circle, the bird count circle, goes all the way out uh, past Spruce Run Mountain that appears like it is likely into West Virginia. Um, but yeah, the circle is inscribed up there, all the way down here into Radford, uh, Allegheny County, but yeah, it goes, includes a large section of Jefferson National Forest, um, out on Brush Mountain, um, oh, what is the, um, I have to double check. Uh, is that it? No. Um, one second. I'm just curious to see Mountain Lake. Anybody who's been here longer than me who's watching, uh, any of my mods, if you're more familiar with the map than I am, is Mountain Lake on here? I'm not sure exactly where Mountain Lake is. For those watching who are curious as to why I'm asking about this place called Mountain Lake, um, it's because Mountain Lake is where the movie Dirty Dancing was filmed. And I'm guessing that it's not included in this bird watching area. It appears to be a bit too far south for that. Yeah, it's, it's outside the uh, observation area. So, Blacksburg, the city of, or the town of Blacksburg is here. Um, the Radford Ordinance is here. The town of Radford is over here. The town of Christiansburg is here. Um, the National Forest is there. And so generally, like, it is centered around Blacksburg Mountain, like roughly around Blacksburg Mountain there. Um, Hercules Power Plant, U.S. government property. I'm not familiar with that, but it looks like that's probably part of the, um, the arsenal out in Radford. Um, but yeah, so a, a fairly decent area. Uh, but yeah, I think Mountain Lake where Dirty Dancing was filmed is much too far southeast of here to have been included in the 
area. Um, and then we get a revised one that inclu includes the zones. Um, interesting. So this includes most of, it looks like it includes all of Christiansburg and half of Radford. You kept looking for Claytor Lake. Yeah, I don't, it, that was too far out. Um, powder plant. Oh, is that what it says? Yeah, that is what it says. Hercules powder plant. Um, so yeah, that would be as in boom. Uh, so I will just, uh, for edification, since this is an educational stream, the uh, Radford Ordnance Works and Hercules Powder Plant that are shown on the map here. Um, the Radford Army Ammunition Plant is an ammunition manufacturing complex for the U U.S. military with facilities located in Pulaski and Montgomery Counties, Virginia. Uh, so this would be the Montgomery County one. The primary mission is to manufacture propellants and explosives in support of field artillery, air defense, tank, missile, aircraft, and Navy weapons systems. Uh, as of 2011, it is operated by BAE Systems. Um, it was established in April 1941 as Radford Ordnance Works and New River Plant. Uh, in 1945, it was renamed the Radford Arsenal 1961, it was renamed Radford Ordnance Plant. But yeah, it's kind of interesting. When, I, um, when I've driven past there in my car and I'll just be like listening to um, any sort of streamed media for, on my phone. So if I'm listening to like iTunes or listening to uh, Minnesota Public Radio on my phone or a podcast or something that I haven't downloaded to the phone, as I drive past the arsenal, I will lose the broadcast. Um, I believe they must be blocking certain signals in that area, which is not surprising. Uh, but yeah, just interesting. Anyway, that's tangential to uh, the bird stuff that we're looking at. Um, so they've zoned things out here. Um, Zone 1, I can't tell what's special about Zone 1. Zone 1 is here. I don't see anything marked on the map that makes it particularly unique. Zone 2 is going to be a mountain. Um, this is a mountain that's to the east of Blacksburg. Um, I, actually, it's kind of, so as you're leaving Blacksburg, you go up to the top of a, uh, a ridge, and then this would be like the valley area um, down past that bridge, or bridge, past that ridge, northwest of where I'm showing. I don't know. Alice, I believe you. If Mountain Lake would be northwest, I, I'm not sure. Geography, spatial relationships, and things like that are um, tend to be visual associations, and I um, am not that great with mental visualization. Uh, three is the southwest portion of the town of Blacksburg. Four... Uh, four, so three is southwest of Blacksburg, and then four is across Struble's Creek. Five is this area that has Blacksburg Mountain listed in it. Six appears to be the southern side of Brush Mountain, um, including I, it looks like it goes right up to the border of the Jefferson National Forest, but I'm not 100% certain on that. Uh, seven includes East Radford. Eight 
Um, eight is the section including Christiansburg and yellow sulfur. Nine appears to mainly be Jefferson National Forest area. And then 10 includes Spruce Run Mountain and part of Clover Hollow Mountain, which are both in that Jefferson National Forest. Anyway, that's probably more detail on the map than you were truly interested in, but I got distracted. Um, interesting. Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute from Charles O. Handley, Jr. Uh, another Dear John letter. Uh, <laughs> Barrow, Colorado. 21 October 76. Dear John, thanks for your letter of 10 October regarding the Blacksburg Christmas bird count. I think we don't have any plans yet for the Christmas season, so we can work around any date that you choose for the count. That should make it a little easier for you to have one without a, di without a date preference. North American migrants are abundant here just now and quite conspicuous. Uh, Bay, I'm not, I'm not sure. It looks like maybe Bay BR. I don't know. And Tennessee warblers are constantly evident. Uh, hawking, hawking insects from window screens in the lab clearing. Also, there are chestnut something. Hmm. Can, and Kentucky warblers and no water thrushes in some numbers. Northern water? Some abbreviations here and not being an avid ornithologist myself, I'm not 100% sure what's being referred to. But interesting how that handwriting was quite easy to read compared to some of the things from the 1800s that we've tried to read on this program. Um, list of, oh, prospective bird counters. Thankfully very old, but it was still addresses, so I wanted to get them off screen as much as possible. Official vehicle, meaning official actual like counting form. So this is the form that they had to fill in, and apparently they had to be very meticulous um, and very precise because uh, they didn't want their observations to be thrown out by the Audubon Society. Um, and <laughs> as was conveyed in that letter, very matter-of-factly, but it came across as with some annoyance. Uh, saying that the Audubon Society would be quite happy to throw out their observations. Um, so we've got, looks like a typed list that has then had the grid added probably by use of a ruler and a pen. It's definitely in pen and it is definitely hand drawn, but the lines are very straight. So that's why I believe it was done with a ruler. And then we just have ruled uh, paper that's had columns put on with various counts. This is interesting. Uh, year starting in 1935 and going to 1967 on that first page. I think that's just like tallying the number of observers, the number of teams, the number of miles covered on foot, the number of hours put into it, as well as conditions, like weather conditions. And then handwritten actual observations of the birds. So the black duck in 1937, there were two observed, 1938, 14, 1939, one, 1940 had 98. 
They went from one in 1939 to 98 in 1940. In 1980, there were 154 black ducks observed. 1978 had 194. So I, that's why those wildly varying numbers is why the Audubon Society would have wanted very particular information about uh, what was the date, because the date variation could matter, um, how many people were observing, how much ground was covered, what the temperature was, what the sky conditions were like, what the weather conditions were like, um, because all of that could determine uh, how many were able to be observed. And that's why you would end up with, in 1939, one, and then the next year, 98. Maybe uh, in 1940, the weather was a lot better. They were able to cover a lot more ground. Um, maybe they observed a couple of days later in the season, or they could compare with like the weather conditions. Um, maybe it was snowy uh, in 1939, and it was kind of balmy and, and warm in 1940. Uh, when you just have the counts, you're like, geez, that's extreme variability. But then when you can take into account other information, um, that might give you a clue for research as to why that might be. This is this is me riffing and speculating uh, based on random things that I'm finding in these folders. But if I was researching this, uh, th this would be really interesting data. Um, ooh, these are. These feel like bank tallies, <laughs> bank ledger paper. Um, this is the actual record of Christmas bird counts. Again, starting in 1935 on here and going to 1961, um, each column has the temperature recorded, uh, the wind and sky conditions recorded, date, is recorded and then down the left hand side they have the different names of the birds and they've got the actual counts filled in. And again this is this is the record keeping of a hobbyist. This is not somebody who got paid to do this work. Uh, Christmas bird counts, 1950s to 1990s. I'm, that's more of the same of what we were looking at, just more dates. Um, correspondence on, and data on research and publications, especially a checklist of the birds. So let's see, we get to read somebody's mail here if I can. Yep. One of the more fun things in archives, getting to read people's mail. <laughs> Although I doubt we'll get very much relationship mail in here. Uh, Dear Dr. Murray, this is from John Murray to Dr. J.J. Murray. Uh, Mr. C.O. Hanley has informed me that you would like a report on the dates of warbler observations made in Blacksburg this spring for use in the Raven. Hence, I am sending you the enclosed account of observations by C.O. Handley, Ralph Brown, and myself. You might also be interested in the following two observations. On April 25th at 12.30 noon, four, forester four foresters' turns 
were seen by me flying over the pond on the VPI campus. They remained there until about 6.30 p.m. Brown and Hanley were informed and they concurred in the identification. Conditions for observation were very favorable as they flew about in bright sunlight, fishing with evident success and occasionally perched on signs reading no fishing or frogging. Mr. Hanley has told me that he has seen terns, which he believed were foresters, on several previous occasions but has not felt sure of their identification due to the poor light conditions. They were mentioned by Smith, but on the basis of a specimen sent to him from outside the county. Hence, this observation appears to be the first sure record of this bird for this county. On June 3rd at about 10.30 a.m., I saw a willet, presumably eastern, about one mile below the college pond on Struble's Creek. It flew up as I approached and then alighted about 50 yards from the creek on the opposite side from me and remained there, silent for at least 20 minutes. The right wing was held lower than the left while in the folded position at rest, indicating that it may have been injured, but not sufficiently to prevent flight. I informed C.O. Handley of its presence at about 2 p.m., and he also saw the bird later that afternoon. Very truly yours, John W. Murray. P.S. As far as I can discover, the Willett record is a new record for Montgomery County. P.S.S. Since writing this, Hanley has sent you the report in question, uh, revised to July 1st, I think is what that says. Oh, but these, these Forster's turns, fishing, when clearly there was a sign that said no fishing or frogging. It's like the birds couldn't read the sign. Let's see. Letters and letters about lists of birds. We've seen this list of birds before. A letter from the Smithsonian Institution, 19 January 1955. Dear John, uh, dear Dr. Murray, uh, here are the Montgomery County bird notes you needed for your list. Yellow rail, three specimens secured and others seen October 1915 by Smith. Uh, Hudsonian curlew, curlew uh, 9 October 1930, 18 March 1935, brown, white, uh, w. Scoter, short E. Owl, blue W. Warbler, Lapland Longspur. I am glad you are revising the list and will be glad to see a copy of it. I hope I can complete work on the annotated list this spring. It's too bad our paths didn't cross at Christmas. Charles O. Hanley, Jr. List of birds. <laughs> this one starts interestingly. Dear Dr. Murray, I have a habit of making bird notes and then either losing them or filing them away so that they can never be found. On clearing my disc desk a few nights ago, I came across a note attached to your list of Montgomery birds compiled last March. On May 20, 1954, I observed two black terns on the small pond in front of Townley's Motor Court. court. Uh, the birds were found around 11 a.m., and that afternoon I watched them for several minutes feeding. I note that you have not shown these birds in your list, although they appear in Murray's checklist as rare in the spring at Blacksburg, April 7 to June 14. I imagine you overlooked this species in making up your list. I don't pay too much attention to casual records, but thought you might be interested in this note. With good wishes, A.O. English. You gotta love personal anecdotes uh, that include uh, implications that somebody doing professional quality work has overlooked something.
But the letter stayed in his records and may have been useful to him. But the tone was very much what one would expect to see in uh, some of the online discourse today. Let's see, what else do we have in these letters? Dr. George A. Hall, Department of Chemistry, West Virginia University, Morgantown, West Virginia. July 11th, July 11th 1965. This appears to be from Alan Reed Keith of Montclair, New Jersey. Dear Dr. Hall, as compiler of the regional area for Audubon Field Notes that includes Blacksburg, Virginia, I am writing you to see if you can help me obtain some additional information on a varied thrush seen there on a Christmas count in 1962. The compiler of the count was Mr. J.W. Murray, whose address I do not have. I am writing a paper on the extra limital. Uh, extra-limital records of the varied thrush, and I'm trying to collect all the information I can on such records, some of which is seldom reported in the literature. I have enclosed a report form, which I have made up for your convenience, which I hope you will be kind enough to fill out with any information you may have in your files and return to me. If you have no information, I will be greatly indebted to you if you could forward this letter and the report form to Mr. Murray, should you know his address, or to send me his address and I will write him directly. If you have no information and do not know Mr. Murray's address, please return the form to me and accept my thanks for this imposition on your time. I know you must be very busy and engaged in your own research, and I would not bother you with this request if I had any other way to get the information. By the way, if you know of any other records of the varied thrush for the area you cover for Audubon Field Notes, please mention them to me, even if you think I might have come across them already. The Blacksburg Report is the only one I have for the whole Appalachian region, going back as far as I have searched the literature, and that extends back to about 1900. But I could have easily overlooked records published in little-known or local periodicals. Thank you very much for any help you can give me, and I look forward to hearing from you soon. Sincerely, Alan R. Keith. Well, that's quite a pleasant letter. I wonder if it was responded to. Let's see. U.S. Government Memorandum. Ducks killed 1966 to 1967 on New River between Radford and 114 Bridge. A total of 48. In addition, one bufflehead and one black duck were killed and not retrieved. This was the only loss we encountered. Huh. I don't know. Well, let's see what else is in this going to move on to the next folder. We are approaching 4 o'clock, which means about a half an hour left. And I do want to look at some bird pictures today, too, um, just because I enjoy them and I think they're a fun way to end. Uh, bird chart. Oh, yeah, these were pretty cool. Um, this actually ended up being the picture that I used for the tweet today. Um, although n not this first page, but these are uh, labeled in here as bird chart, February through December, um, but <clears throat> we don't know what the year is. Um, and these are just really interesting to me uh, as tallies of observations. So, as you can see, actually, I'm not certain. So, there are multiple dates on here. We, like, here we have the uh, Hobel's Grebe, the red-necked grebe, noted in February uh, with the Parenthetical 1914 SI. Um, 
And I don't know what that means. But if I dug through enough of the material and really studied the material in this collection, I could probably figure out, I'm guessing SI is probably an indication of who observed it in 1914. Um, <clears throat> here down at the bottom, we have uh, the Canada goose um, with observations in February and April. I'm guessing March is between there somewhere. Um, the ones here, there are three noted in June and July. And in a parenthetical on it, it says, possibly barnyard escapes. But here uh, on the second page, can see just the sheer number of tick marks for all of the observations of mallards and black ducks and wow look at the American whippion which uh, it said bald pate but that's crossed out and says American whippion uh, and just all those little tick marks from February through early May, and then it just stops. And they're not observed during the summer, and then starts up again, it looks like, in September. And just many, many, many in through December when there's just lots of them. So these are clearly uh, tick marks related to observation of the birds um, and you can see which ones are migrating and which ones are here year-round so here on this page you've got um, so the bufflehead here at the top uh, they're in this area in February or January February March April basically gone by May and then they return it looks like in November and they're here in November and December whereas the turkey vulture um, observed somewhat sporadically in January and February but they start to basically be regularly observed in March it seems like they're most often observed in April uh, but they're here basically all summer and then they um, are observed less in November and December. So the difference being the bufflehead um, comes and winters here. And in the summer, it returns north to its summer habitat. So it migrates to this area and spends the winter in this area, whereas the turkey vulture um, while it can stay here year-round, it looks like, uh, tends to migrate a little bit further south during November, December, January, and February, um, but then stays here most of the year. Which, you can get that kind of information about the bird's migratory patterns just from looking at the observational tick marks in here. Um, and it doesn't take much to see it because when there are lots of, lots of observations, there are just lots of little tick marks right next to each other. And so you get kind of a frequency map in just the tally that's been recorded. And I just think it's absolutely cool. Like, I find this really neat to look at. Because it's literally just tick marks, it's an actual count of some sort, but it ends up being an illustration or a graphical representation um, just as a result of the repeated recording of the data. Uh, and so like something like this, uh, if you were recording it on a computer, you would have all of this um, software creating graphs and things like that when doing it by hand this way you don't even need to make the graph you've got the visual distribution um, already done 
by the time you're done recording the data. <laughs> A little nerve envious of their graphing skill. <laughs> like, I just, wow, the precision with which they managed to do those tick marks. And then at times when they um, needed to add more but didn't have any more room to spread out horizontally, they added dots above it. So here, the Nighthawk in uh, September, you can see end of, end of August and September, you can see they did tick marks and then they've got dots above it. Um, and so I don't particularly know whether the tick marks equate to actual numbers observed. Um, my suspicion is that they do not. But in some way, there is a relationship between the tick marks and the dots and uh, quantity observed. Um, but based on the physical distribution of things across this graph paper, not only are these darkened lines the month divisions, so that you've got August here, September here, um, but the physical distribution of the tick marks uh, corresponds to when in the month. So uh, if I look at this, um, the screech owl here, observed at the very beginning of August, observed, I'm going to guess about halfway, maybe the end of the first week of August. Um, so August would have roughly four weeks in it. There's only three columns here, but they've distributed the tick marks throughout so that you can tell some of them were toward the early part of the month, most of them were in the middle of the month, and there were a couple closer to the end of the month. Oh, Hannah, I'm sorry, but thank you for coming by, and uh, yeah, I will see you next time. So I, of everything in this collection, this was kind of the most visually interesting, which is why I ended up using this uh, one of these pages as the image for the, um, the tweet that I sent out about today's stream. Just really, really interesting to me. And he clearly cared a lot about ornithology. He may have been a chemistry professor, but he clearly cared a great deal about the work that he did on ornithology. And it shows. Um, this may not have been what he was paid for, but he definitely dedicated a lot of time and effort to it. So here we have. Uh, Virginia Bird Notes and Bird List by C.O. Handley. Uh, so this was something that was just part of uh, John Murray's papers. Um, this appears to have been in a binder of some sort. Uh, based on this, I would say it was probably in a one of those like um, colored, like cardboard almost binders. Uh, just because of the discoloration here um, in the part that was actually bound. <clears throat> it doesn't really matter. Um, it looks like it was probably removed from that in order to preserve the paper better. Uh, anyway, it looks like this is a report of some sort. October 23rd, 1951. Please find enclosed a copy of a summary of my Virginia bird notes. This is complete for the period 1935 to about 1941, but is rather sketchy for the remainder of the time that I made observations in Virginia. All of my notes, particularly those from the time Charles Jr. went into the army to the time I left Blacksburg in September 1947, were not in a form that I could readily summarize them. I suspect that you too have some observations that you could add. I would suggest that you give them to Do Dr. J.J. Murray of Lexington in order that they may be included in the book which he is preparing on the birds of Virginia. 
The manuscript for the book is just about ready and will be within a few and will be within a few weeks. So if you have any notes of particular interest or see any errors in my summary of the Blacksburg notes, they should be sent in at once. With best regards, sincerely yours, uh, Charles Handley, who was the chief of the Division of Game Management, apparently. And so this is apparently a write-up of some observations of birds. Including not just the dates and numbers seen, but notes about the observation itself. Oh, and we've got the thin paper. Um, not quite onion skin, but... Uh, thin, translucent paper. So this is about, um, I'm, I'm not sure, it feels, I want to say it's like about half the weight of standard printer paper. Um, it's definitely see-through. Uh, as you can see, you can see the text on the next page through this page. Um, fairly common at certain points in history and uh, when was this? The mid 1940s or something? 1951. Um, interesting that the the cover page and the introductory letter were on like standard weight paper, and then after that you get to these actual like observations, and you've got this um, lighter weight paper. It holds up really well, but this is definitely not the lightest weight paper that I've come across in archives. Um, various observations of various birds. And honestly, with how many pages this is, I'm kind of glad it's lighter weight paper. If it was standard weight paper, it would actually make carrying the archives around heavier. Because <laughs> while weight kind of refers to the thickness of the paper, it actually does also equate to how heavy things are. The Story of a Bird Lover by William Earl Dodge Scott published The Outlook Company, New York, 1903. Excerpt from Chapter 3, Student Days, concerning trip to Colburg, West Virginia. In the next vacation, a great delight awaited me. A school friend of my mother had married William H. Edwards, a naturalist, who was particularly interested in insects and more especially in butterflies. My mother had kept up a rather desultory correspondence with her friend, and in an interchange of letters in the spring, an invitation was extended to me to visit the family and spend the coming vacation at their home. They had formerly lived in Newburgh on the Hudson, and I had been there once. But after the Civil War, Mr. Edwards became engaged in coal mining in West Virginia and removed to the Kawa uh, Kanawha Valley. Located at the town of Colburg, where he had extensive mines which were being worked and which needed his constant attention, he had a son and two daughters about my own age. So I began to equip myself for my first real expedition as a naturalist. It was only a small stock of powder, some dust shot, a few pounds of arsenic, some cotton, needles and thread, notebooks, and my tools that went with me, but I shall never forget the preparation. Many times since I have fitted myself for prolonged stays in the wilderness with stores, provisions, and equipments of various kinds, most elaborate and bulky, but I look back to the day when I spent my few dollars for the things I have described for my trip to West Virginia and feel again the joy and anticipation which no subsequent prepar preparation has awakened. I went by rail to Baltimore, thence via Harper's Ferry to Parkersburg on the Ohio River, and by steamboat on this river to a town near the mouth of the Kanawha called Gallip uh, Gallipoli, where another boat conveyed me up the Kanawha River to Colburg. This was a roundabout journey, and the boat part of it exceedingly slow. 
On the way I saw several birds never met with alive, and two of them I observed particularly. The first was the red-headed woodpecker, conspicuous from his definite markings exhibited in flight, and the other the turkey buzzard, at which I never ceased to wonder, as it soared with so much ease, or passed the trains as if they were stationary. I was received with the kindest welcome at Kohlberg, then a remote place where they saw few people from the north. Desultory correspondence is a great descriptor. Yes, organ Mike. Kohlberg is situated in the valley of the Kanoa River, which is here narrow with high hills on either side. The river is about a quarter of a mile wide generally, winding in and out among hills. The rise abruptly just back from the river, there being little bottom, bottom land. At the time I visited this region, they were heavily timbered with a growth of pop poplar, beech, oak, and some chestnut, though beech was one of the most noticeable of the forest trees. Small streams flowed down at frequent intervals from the high hills above, which formed a spur of the Allegheny Range. They can hardly be called mountains, as they attain a height of not more than 700 feet above the level of the river. From my paper published in 1872, I quote the following sentences. This elevation, however, is great enough to make a very decided variation in the temperature and surrounding conditions from those of the valley, and hence affords some interesting facts relative to the local distribution of the species uh, through the same area of the country. The birds of the Allegheny and fauna generally are found on the mountainsides and tops, and those of the Carolinian fauna in the valleys. Of course, in so small an area, birds of both the above-mentioned faunae were found in either of the localities, but the above seems to be the general rule. In subsequent parts of this narrative, I shall have to tell something of the geographical distribution of North, North American birds, and I call attention to these few short sentences as indicative and of generalizations that will be developed. Just above Kohlberg, an island divided the river. This island was heavily wooded, and there was a very dense and tangled undergrowth, a great resort for birds. At places along the river, though the banks were generally high as well as abrupt and steep, there were small beaches of shingle. And here I made the acquaintance of large-billed water thrush. When I first saw the water thrushes at some little distance, they seemed to be some kind of sandpiper, with which I was not acquainted. There was the same tilting motion, the same rapid running, followed by a pause and tilt characteristic of the whole group of sandpipers and emphasized in our freshwater species. All the habits of these water thrushes impressed me as sandpiper-like, and here it may, well it may be well to call attention to a fact that has always seemed to me of particular interest in the group which we call songbirds. The matter referred to is the reversion to ancestral habits and methods of life among this kind of perching birds. Though ornithologists disagree as to details, some assigning one family and others another as the highest in rank, they all agree that for the group of songbirds, for the group of songbirds, wait, they all agree that the group of songbirds represents the summit of development in bird life. For instance, the family of thrushes is believed by some to be as the, at the pinnacle, and others assign that place to the family of crows, but there is no difference in opinion as to the entire group position. <clears throat> anyway, I'm not going to read the entire thing, but it seems rather interesting. Then we have more excerpts from chapter 9 of the same book. It's published in 1903, so out of, out of copyright by now. So I don't mind reading sections of it, but um, I want to look at some bird pictures for the rest of the time. And these are readily available as part of our collections. Um, so that was a decent look at what was in the John, uh, John Murray papers here. Again, a chemistry professor at Virginia Tech who um,
donated his uh, papers on his work with ornithology to our archives. And uh, quite interesting. But I still have some of these selected works from our uh, rare books collection. And I want to go ahead and take a look at some of those. Here you can see this book um, has some cotton string around it. Um, and that is to hold it together. Um, this is actually in much better condition than most of the ones that I see with the string on them. Uh, so I'm not 100% sure what damage to it caused us to put string around it. Um, but generally, it's because something with the binding is coming loose. So I'll be gentle with it as I open it. Uh, this book is one of the ones that came to us as part of the Bailey Law Collection, which was originally donated to the bio biology department. Um, and as you can see, was stamped as such when it was donated there. And then years later, it came to the archives and became part of our rare books collection. 26 Common Birds to Accompany Audubon Bird Chart, published by Massachusetts Audubon Society, 234 Berkeley Street, Boston. Uh, so it's by Ralph Hoffman, and it was published in 1899. various charts, uh, contents. American Goldfinch, American Robin, Baltimore Oriole, Barn Swallow, Black and White Warbler, Bluebird, Blue Jay, Bobolink, Catbird, Cedarbird, Chickadee, Chimney Swift, Chipping Sparrow, Downy Woodpecker, Flicker, Golden Crowned Kinglet, House Wren, Kingbird, Purple Finch, Red-Eyed Vireo, Ruby-throated hummingbird, red-winged blackbird, scarlet tanager, song sparrow, wood thrush, and yellow warbler. So those are the 26 common birds. If one of them is one you would particularly like me to turn to, do let me know. Otherwise, I'm just going to pick ones that sound interesting to me. Um, I because of one of the first works of fiction that got me into reading books, I happen to be particularly fond of the Wren, um, because one of the characters in that work was named Wren. So I'm going to start there, and it appears to be page 24. Maybe. Nope, it's item 24 on page 22. The House Wren. Troglodytes Aidon. The Wren, like the Bluebird and Martin, seems to be a true lover of country surroundings. When the house becomes too thick, it moves away. When the houses become too thick, it moves away. But wherever orchards or wide dooryards separate the houses, it inhabits either the hollow knot holes or the boxes put up for his use. If these are not available, almost anything that is hollow will serve an old shoe or hat or a water spout. All have sheltered a brood of wrens. The nest is composed of moss, sticks, and straw, which completely fill the hollow and in which a lining of soft material the female lays from six to eight, and on which a lining of soft material the fem. I lost that sentence while I was reading it. Sorry. The nest is composed of moss, sticks, and straw, which completely fill the hollow and in which on a lining of soft material, the female lays from six to nine eggs, thickly marked with reddish brown. The male often builds other nests after the female has laid in the first, but no satisfactory explanation of this habit has been suggested. The pair defend their nest with great boldness, showing, particularly, showing particular dislike to cats. Their note when excited is a peculiar, harsh chatter, but their song is voluble and pleasing. The sexes and young resemble each other. 
The food of the wren consists of spiders and other insects. The wren leaves New England in September for the southern states and returns in early May. So this book appears to mostly be descriptive of the birds. And since I was particularly looking for images, I'm going to set it aside and pull one of the others that might have pictures. Because um, I was hoping to show off a couple pictures before the end of the stream. But I may refer to that if I get pictures of something that's in that book. I'll read that book and show the picture from the, another one. What is this? The Geological Survey of California, Ornithology, Volume 1, Land Birds. Oh, this is the Birds of California. We have various illustrations of birds. Uh, the great eared finch. Siberian finch, gray crowned finch. Genus Xanthocephalus, Bonaparte. <laughs> Entire hotels in California just for eagles. <laughs> uh, Icteridae the Orioles, Xanthocephalus. Genus Xanthocephalus Bonaparte. Xanthocephalus Bonaparte conspectus, 1850. Type Icterophallus Bonaparte. General characteristics. Bill conical, the length about twice the height, the outlines nearly straight. Claws all very long, much curved, the inner lateral the longest, reaching beyond the middle of the middle claw. Tail narrow, nearly even, the outer web scarcely widening to the end. Wings long, much longer than the tail, the first quill longest. There is a species in South America so closely resembling ours that they were at first considered identical. Interesting. Xenocephalus. Sorry, Xanthocephalus icterocephalus bonaparte, the yellow-headed blackbird. Hmm. So they have small illustrations in here. This is actually a two-volume work. Um, the distribution of the birds of California. And our two, uh, it, our two volumes of it, while we have both, are in library bindings and they do not match. <laughs> so volume two is the brown one and volume one is the orange one. But we have both volumes. Um, let me pull one of the lovely, lovely, I'm just going to pull up. Remember this book? You just can't leave the hotels. Yeah, Kira. Hotel California. You can check out, but you can never leave. This is the one that's all in German, and I don't remember what any of the bird names are in German. But the, the, the pictures are just so pretty. <laughs> and we only have a few minutes left. Uh, I could try typing these into Google Translate again. Um, and if any of them are the ones that I have descriptions of in the 26 common birds, I will read that description while we look at the image. But uh, actually, we are getting towards the end, so I should probably. Well, I'll try to do one. 
do do do. We'll see how this goes. Das Blau. Blau fur. Well, uh, number three here on the right is Das uh, Blaufelchen, which is the blue throat, which is definitely not in this book. But <laughs> Lady Emberwolf, thank you very much. Um, uh, Fludem, if you want to read German to me, uh, you are welcome to tell me what birds these are. But um, we are basically at the end of this stream. So I think I'm just going to leave them on the screen for a minute while I tell you about what's coming up next week. Um, but yeah, this appears to be Das uh, Rotfeldchen and Das Blaufeldchen, uh, which appears to be the red, the red throat and the blue throat, I think. I have one semester of German. <laughs> uh, combined with Google Translate, that sometimes gets me usable, uh, enough of a translation where I'm able to figure things out. Um, but coming up next week, we have the ML Foley collection. Uh, it covers 1958 to 1964. And let's see, this collection includes receipts and more than 100 pieces of incoming and outgoing correspondence relating to M.L. Foley's business selling birds out of Salem, Virginia. Foley's letters concerned the breeding, sale, and shipment of birds throughout the U.S., as well as Central and South America. The collection also contains receipts for birds, freight, feed, licenses, and more. Um, we don't appear to have any biographical information about M.L. Foley, so um, we will just take a look at the material about uh, that bird selling business from the late 50s and early 60s. And the rest of the time, we will um, indulge in more of these uh, bird images might take some more time to look at this, um, the lovely illustrations in this German bird book, but we also have all of the other bird illustrations that we had. I will keep on hand the guide here to the 26 common birds, and if we come across a good picture of one of them, I'll show the picture and read the entry. Um, next week will be our last ornithology and oology week. Uh, followed the week after by our uh, dive into looking into the history of American backyard uh, grilling and the tradition of American barbecue. Um, so that is what we will focus on in July. I want to thank you all for coming to the stream today. I really enjoy doing the archival streams on Wednesdays. It gives me a chance to see what we have in our collections. Like I said, oftentimes, as with the collection today, it's a collection I've never had um, a specific reason to look at before. So I get to pull out collections that I've not seen before and broaden my knowledge of what we have, as well as just get a chance to kind of deep dive and look at stuff. So often, um, the job of an archivist is organizing the material, and even if we're the one that processed the collection, we don't necessarily know everything that's in it because we will look at something long enough to be able to write it in, uh, describe what's in the collection, and tell people what order things are in. But we don't get to sit down and like read a letter. Um, so this gives me a chance to sit down with a collection and actually engage with the material, which I really enjoy. Uh, so I am going to go ahead and look and see if we can do our regular raid today. Um, 
it does look like the Monterey Bay Aquarium is live. Let me see what they're doing. Uh, so the Monterey Bay Aquarium is live. We will be heading over there. They have shark cam today. Um, so it should be some nice chill time watching their shark aquarium. Um, and that is where we're gonna head. But yeah, thank you all for stopping by today. Thank you for hanging out. Um, anybody who was chatting, thank you for that. Thank you, Eric, for the raid to the Rogan 27 channel and Wraith for the bits. Um, and I hope to see you back next week uh, for our last ornithology stream um, before we dive into uh, American Backyard Grilling next month. Um, thank you all. I'm going to switch us over to the ending screen and we will head over to the aquarium very shortly. See you next time. Uh, maybe.